Hello again. Uh, my discussion today is going to be about cells, uh, which, are, which is the basis of life. So perhaps we will be uh, coming up with a definition of life, if there is such a thing that's possible. So just kind of starting with the idea that, um, you know, life is complicated. There are uh, many, we, we have this understanding of what life is. There are many different ways of looking at it. Um, but a biologist or uh, somebody who looks at, studies life as part of their um, scientific career, looks at, you know, tries to come up with standard ways to um, explain anything. So that would also apply to what is a living thing or living organism. So I just wanted to start off by showing you how hard this is. So uh, this is a journal article that you can see from a, a journal called Astrobiology. So that is about life in space. And uh, for the longest time, it was believed there could be no life in space, but now we have journals that are dedicated to the study of living things that are in space. And so one of the things that astrobiologists do is sit around and discuss, all right, so if we're gonna go looking for life, then what exactly is it that we're looking for? And so in this article, um, it's kind of a proceedings, a review of, the thought of how to go, what, what exactly astrobiologists are looking for, or what is life. And, um, just, you know, reading through this abstract really quickly, he notes that, I remember a conference of a scientific elite that sought to answer the question, what is life? Is an enzyme alive? Is a cell alive? After many hours of launching balloons that defined life in a sentence, followed by equally conclusive punctures of these balloons, a solution seemed at hand. The ability to reproduce, that is the essential characteristic of life, said one statement of science. And everyone nodded in agreement that it is an essential of life, the ability to reproduce, to make more of oneself. And then somebody in the group said, okay, so then one rabbit is not alive because it takes two to make baby rabbits. So they said, okay, so now we have to go back to the drawing board. And at that point, um, you know, everyone was convinced, and I think everybody still is convinced that there is no simple definition of life. Even though we all know what it is, we feel it, trying to come up with a concrete description can be very difficult. And I think you'll see that um, in, in a little while. So if we're going to start uh, talking about what life is from a biology perspective, uh, we always have to go look back to the cell theory. So the cell theory was created by scientists, again, going back a couple hundred years, um, who recognized that life was cellular, that um, you know, all living things that they noted at that time were composed of a cell or cells. And so therefore they concluded that the cell is the basic unit of life and to be a living thing, therefore you had to be cellular, you had to be made of cells. And that cells arrive from pre-existing cells. And this goes back to the idea that before anybody said this as a rule, there was a belief that cells came, that magically appeared, that they didn't have to come from certain types of cells, that they didn't have to come from um, you know, parent cells. So Pasteur was, uh, again, the scientist that put that whole idea to rest, that life does not arise spontaneously, that life comes from pre-existing life. And life starts at the cellular level. Okay, so looking at what um, cells are a little bit, they are the basic unit of life, but not all cells are the same. There are some things that are the same in all types of cells, however. So the, these are what I call the must-haves. To be a cell, um, a cell must have the, the following, and then realize that there are several types of upgrades to this basic floor plan, um, which is where different cell types come from. But at the very minimum, what a cell has to have is a cell membrane. I kind of view this as perhaps the thing that defines a cell. If you have a cell membrane, you now have a boundary. There's outside the cell and there's inside the cell. So the cell membrane or plasma membrane surrounds um, a colloid-like liquid, a fluid that is referred to as the cytoplasm. So then within the cytoplasm, um, you must have 
DNA or RNA, which as I hope you recall from previous biology courses, that this is how genetic information is stored and transferred. And as far as we are concerned at the moment, all genes and all organisms are made out of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA are transfer molecules that take the information from the DNA and transfer it to make proteins. You have to have ribosomes to make proteins. So you need DNA and RNA, but the ribosomes are the builders. They are the ones that read the instructions carried in the DNA by the RNA to the ribosomes who make proteins. So um, proteins are essential to life for very many reasons, but not the least of which because proteins are enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts, biological catalysts. They make chemical reactions occur um, at a speed that you know, you don't have to wait around for a couple million years before a chemical reaction occurs. Um, and so that gives cells the ability to transform matter and energy. And what I mean by that is that they can consume nutrients, they can convert it into um, ATP, which they use for cellular work, and they also use uh, the metabolites of smaller molecules for a whole bunch of other things, not the least of which is for building blocks. So these are you know, I, I get, like I said, the must-haves of a cell. However, over the past, you know, 50 years or so, it's become abundantly clear that there are two distinct types of cells that can be identified. And those are called prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells, which, you know, effective immediately, you can start thinking of as bacteria or bacterial cells because those are prokaryotes, are bacteria. Um, they are, they have the basic cell floor plan <clears throat> and very little extra. Um, on the inside anyway, on the outside they get a little more complicated. Uh, eukaryotes on the other hand are the classic cells with um, lots of compartments and endomembrane system um, and a little more complex. They have the upgrades to the floor plan on the inside um, and sometimes to the outside as well. So comparing and contrasting these two, a pro prokaryotic organisms, so in other words, a living thing that is made out of prokaryotic cells is a prokaryote. And likewise, um, an organism, a living thing that is made out of eukaryotic cells is referred to as a eukaryote. So because this is microbiology and I have a, a bias toward bacteria, and I do that because in practically every other biology course you take, you focus on the eukaryotes, right? So um, biology professors tend to be eukaryotic bigots in some cases. So I'm gonna you know, do my best to, to spread the good word about the prokaryotes. But the prokaryotes are gonna be the focus of, um, that, that particular cell type is gonna be the focus of what we talk about today. So let's look at a close-up, right? So taking that prokaryotic cell. What are characteristics that are common to prokaryotic cells? And the most notable, um, I think, is number two here, that the genome, <clears throat> the DNA of the organism, is not contained within a nucleus. And that actually is the distinctive thing that separates the prokaryotes from the eukaryotes. They are also unicellular, meaning as an organism, they are one cell. Okay, but I don't want you to be misled to think that they are independent actors because although they have everything they need contained within one cell to do their own biology, they live in communities, they live in um, populations, and they communicate with each other and they act in coordinated fashions, which is sort of what multicellular organisms do. The only difference is multicellular organisms can make tissues. These guys just hang out together and um, do things in the coordinated fashion. So I'm gonna stick with the unicellular, but realize, you know, multicellular life might have arisen um, at, at, at some, to some degree with the growth of bacteria in populations. So I, it's also safe to say that they're microscopic, which means you need a microscope to see bacteria. Um, and that is there are no known bacteria that are large enough to be seen with the unaided eye. There are some that get close. There's um, one called a polypicium, which is considered, was considered a giant, it still is a giant among bacteria because it's almost a millimeter big, but that's still pretty small. And the only way it got discovered was a bunch of scientists looking at microscopes. 
So they're small um, and they are unicellular. And as I said, the genome is, there's no nuclear membrane, no nucleus, but they do have a genome. They do have DNA and RNA, um, which is just in the cytoplasm. So there are two major groups of prokaryotic organisms, the prokaryotes, as I showed you last time, those being the bacteria and the archaea. Two of the three major branches of the tree of life are actually prokaryotic. So what I want to do is just kind of focus on the unique um, characteristics, the unique features of prokaryotes um, to kind of talk through those so that you can recognize how uniquely wonderful bacterial cells can be. Some of them are boring, some of them are fascinating, some of them I could talk about for hours, uh, but that wouldn't get us through this. So we'll just stick to the plan here. Okay, so starting with the nucleoid. So you remember from your eukaryotic bias days that the, you know, the nucleus was where the DNA uh, and RNA, and some, some types of RNA are stored in a eukaryotic cell like your cells, your cheek cell, for example. In a bacterial cell, um, the, the DNA, the genome of the bacteria is packaged very tightly, but it's not wrapped up in a membrane. So it's in the cytoplasm, but it is all nicely compacted up in a nice little bunch and that takes up a good part of the interior space of the cell, and that is referred to as a nucleoid, so a nucleus-like structure, but there's no membrane surrounding it. And so here, this green dotted line just represents, this would be the area, all of this is the DNA, and then this represents the cytoplasm and ribosomes, which is what would be in the cytoplasm of a bacterial cell. And then I also want to point out that, um, you know, the genome of the bacterial cell is contained within this nucleoid, but bacteria may also have extra pieces of DNA that carry uh, accessory genes, if you will, called plasmids. So those are not part of the nucleoid. Those are found in the cytoplasm. Some bacteria have one, some bacteria have many, some bacteria have none at all. So those are separate and distinct, and we'll be talking more about those when we talk about the genetics of uh, bacterial cells. Okay, so I mentioned that in the cytoplasm is where you find the ribosomes. Ribosomes, again, are those structures that you remember from your biology days that were responsible for making proteins. That is their job. They read the instructions in the DNA with the help of the RNA to produce proteins. So what I, the point I want to make is that there are differences between the ribosomes that bacteria have and the ribosomes that eukaryotes have. That all has to do with evolution, um, but it, the, the differences are significant enough that we have drugs, chemicals called antibiotics that can impact prokaryotic ribosomes, meaning stop the bacteria from being able to make proteins while not harming eukaryotic ribosomes. And that's because there are distinct targets that the ribosomes are different enough from one another that um, they, they can be differentiated. So prokaryotic ribosomes, um, which remember this is the universal ribosome structure, right? Two subunits that come together, kind of clamp down on a messenger RNA molecule to go through the process of reading the messenger RNA and producing proteins. And each subunit is made out of a combination of proteins and RNA molecules, very small RNA molecules that are referred to as ribosomal RNA. So the rRNAs are structural components of the ribosome. So notice um, in the prokaryotic ribosome, there's a, in the large subunit, there's a total of 31 different proteins and the small subunit, a total of 21 different proteins the types of ribosomal RNAs in a prokaryotic ribosome in the large subunit, they're always, ribosomes are measured in terms of this big S, which stands for Svedberg unit, which has to do in a very broad sense with how compact they can become, right? So it's not their mass or their anything, you know, their shape, it's about how compact they are when they're measured by a particular method developed by Svedberg. So um, this is the 23S and the 5S ribosomal RNAs. And then notice in the small subunit is 16S ribosomal RNA. And I just wanna go back one lecture and say that when we were discussing 
ways to investigate bacteria, right? The, the realm of all bacteria, we can go after their genes, right? We go, instead of trying to grow them in culture, we now can just go hunting for their genes. This in particular is one of those genes that, um, that we go looking for because it is unique to bacteria. So we can selectively remove the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Okay, that's in the DNA. We remove that, grab it, and then sequence it to identify bacteria and to compare it to other types of bacteria and try to you know, place it in phylogenetic trees and see you know, who its nearest relatives are. So that's why I circled this here. So this is um, the, that particular target. And then when you compare that to eukaryotic ribosomes, notice the um, ribosomal RNAs are different in the large subunit, they're different from the smallest subunit, and notice this is 18S ribosomal RNA. So this, by the way, is the target when you do that kind of um, sequencing, uh, amplicon sequencing, you go looking for this if you're looking for eukaryotes, right? So you can do that both ways. So notice overall, the eukaryotic ribosomes are bigger, they have more proteins, they have different ribosomal RNAs than do prokaryotic ribosomes. And you're probably thinking, is this really that important? And it is, uh, because as I mentioned, there's many biological differences that, that stem from this, not the least of which being that we have targets, we can use these two targets to distinguish between those two groups of living things in experiments. So that's, uh, you know, ribosomes, the function is the same, but the structure is different. Okay, so the, the next thing that one of the must-haves was, of course, cell membrane. Most bacteria, I guess it's safe to say most, have a cell wall. So all of them have a cell membrane. All cells have a cell membrane. Some of them have a cell wall. So we're going to just go look at those two features. What I'm gonna say about the cell membrane is it's a phospholipid bilayer, which is what we've been saying about cell membranes you know, in biology forever. So it, that is not different from any other type of cell. It is a, a fluid mosaic, if you will, meaning that the phospholipids are kind of floating. They're put together as a result of interactions with water and they surround the cytoplasm and the contents of the cell. The cell wall, is external, right? So it's outside of the cell membrane. It's a coating. It is a protective barrier layer, if you will. It's not really a barrier, but it's a protective coating around the outside of the cell. And so looking at it, and I noticed the name here, peptidoglycan, um, is a key molecule that's found in bacterial cell walls. And I'm obsessed with peptidoglycan. It's a very, very cool substance. But um, what you need to know right now is how to be able to spell it and say it, right? So peptidoglycan, and we're gonna talk about the structure of it, but most bacterial cell walls, here I go with the most again, um, have this molecule in as part of the construction material. So then going to see what, um, what's, what are the jobs of the bacterial cell wall, right? So the membrane is the permeability barrier. It is the thing that filters stuff going in, filter stuff going out. It's very important, not, not minimizing that, but what is the role of the bacterial cell wall? And um, it, it's, a, you know, the peptidoglycan makes it a, a kind of a rigid um, molecule, rigid barrier, if you will. And so here's, here are some of the jobs, right? So, and this, may, I don't, you know, I, it, this is what happens when you have a cell that is surrounded by a cell wall. The cell has a characteristic shape. And so it turns out bacteria have very characteristic shapes, which is a feature that we can actually look at and use and that helps us identify them, helps us study, study them. It also gives bacteria antigenic properties. And what that means is if the bacteria are associated with a living thing that has an immune system like us, um, our immune system recognizes parts of the bacterial cell wall. And in good, good ways, and you know, just as a form of communication between the bacteria and our immune system. Sometimes that communication leads to an attack on the bacterial cell because it is sensed that it is a dangerous thing, but other times it doesn't, which is, again, one of those complicated 
um, parts of clinical medicine these days is who are the good guys and who are the bad guys because our immune systems react one way or another. They can mediate cell to cell interactions. In other words, the cell wall is a, a way that they bacteria can communicate with each other, the components of the cell wall. And then um, they resist the invasion of external substances. Okay, so it doesn't, it's not a barrier. Uh, you know, it's not like a plastic coating. It's, um, it's porous. So something, some things can go in and some things can go out. One of those things is water. And one of the things about us being a cell out in the real world is that you are subject to whatever the forces of nature happen to be. Water is a force of nature. So water can invade the cell through the cell membrane. Um, it protects against lysis. It protects against that kind of fluctuation so that the cell has a nice, um, you know, it's like being safe and sound inside of a cozy little wrap. And that, those are the, the major roles of the cell wall. So I wanted to talk a little bit about peptidoglycan. Um, and like I said, this is cool stuff. Um, and we could talk about this for a long time. If we were taking a chemistry class, we would talk about it. But this is a biology course. And so what you need to really recognize is that this is a molecule, a very large molecule. Um, it's composed of sugars and proteins. The sugars, which are, make up these long chains uh, that are found in most bacteria, not necessarily all, are these two, right? So NAM stands for N-acetylmuramic acid, and NAG stands for N-acetylglucosamine. And I think important thing to remember is that they are sugars um, that are attached to short peptides. So that's in, remember NAM and NAG because they are alternating. You'll notice that there is um, NAG, NAM, NAG. So they alternate in these, to form these long chains. And then their peptide uh, subunits that are on the muramic acid cross-link with each other. So we end up with something that looks like a chain link fence or chain mail, which in case you are wondering what this wacky thing was, that's what that is, is a coat of chain mail, which is, if you happen to be a knight, what you would wear because it provides a protective outer layer where stuff can still go back and forth across it, but arrows and, and things like that, sticks and stones, are not going to get through and cause lethal damage, or at least not in the area that you are wearing that chain mail. So that's how I like to think of pepsidoglycan. Okay, so there are several types, I, I think it's safe to say most bacteria have a cell wall, at least the ones that we are most familiar with uh, have cell walls that contain peptidoglycan. So the three types of cell walls that are um, important, and like I said, the, the bacteria that are medically important, the ones that we've been able to study the most over the past hundred years, have cell walls that fit into one of these three groupings. So they're referred to as either gram-positive or gram-negative um, or acid-fast. That's what this cell wall is. But notice, here's the cell membrane in all three cases. And then this is representing the peptidoglycan. So gram-positive, gram-negative bacterial cells, gram-positive are known because they have a, a very many, many layers of that chain mail. So our weird looking night is wearing 40 layers of chain mail. Imagine that, that's a gram positive cell. Gram negative cell only has one. And again, here, um, the, it only has one, right? The peptidoglycan or a very thin layer of peptidoglycan in the acid fast cell wall. So that's a major distinguishing feature between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. In addition to that, those differences, also the gram positive cell wall has, um, is cross-linked. So because there's so many layers, think about being that knight that's wearing all of these different layers of peptoglycan, they're gonna be sliding around all over the place. So the individual layers are connected with molecules called toca excuse me, tachoic acids. Um, and the ones that anchor them into the membrane are referred to as lipotachoic acids. Right, so these are the molecules that bind, if you will, that cell, that thick, thick coating to the bacterial cell and to each other. 
the gram negative cell is unique because it again it has this thin layer of peptidoglycan it also has these what are called periplasmic spaces right so this is called the periplasm which means there's an open space in between the cell membrane and the cell wall where the bacteria don't let that go to waste they use it for chemistry and among other things but what's different about the gram negative cell is that it has an outer membrane which is a bilayer one layer is phospholipids and the other is this very interesting molecule called a lipopolysaccharide lps so here is what lipopolysaccharide looks like up close and personal. The little ta 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 tails you see sticking up here are chains of, of saccharides, sugars. And then this is the lipid part. This is the part that is embedded in, you know, down making a connection with the phospholipids that are on the other side of the membrane. So it is a bilayer of membranes. One side is phospholipid, the other is lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide is very interesting stuff. Um, and this is, th there's a lot of um, communication that goes on through the lipopolysaccharide layer. It is also known to be a, a pretty significant toxin if it gets released into our systems. Um, it can cause toxic shock, in fact. So that's this part uh, down here at the bottom, this lipid A is endotoxin. So all of these things we'll, we'll talk more about in the future. This cell wall is really interesting. So again, we've got a few layers of peptidoglycan, and then we have this tangled mess of sugars, and then we have this very interesting um, molecule called mycolic acid. So this is a type of lipid that is waxy. So these, these lipids are, you know, flimsy. This is a waxy or much stronger type of lipid. So we have our coating, then we have um, some the arabinins or, or sugar um, complexes, and then we have these mycolic acids and then some other stuff, okay? So what's interesting about the acid fast cell is that these mycolic acids are like dipping the bacteria in a coat of wax. So they are resistant to a lot of things. They're resistant to staining, they're resistant to antibiotics, they're resistant to chemical exposures. These are very hardy types of bacteria. So these were discovered, uh, acid fast bacteria were discovered because when our good friend Christian Graham, who was one of the golden age microbiologists, uh, developed his method for Graham staining, um, which we will be doing in the lab, he found that there were some types of cells that you were not able to stain. One of them happened to be the cells of tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And again, remember going back 150 years, tuberculosis was a uh, major health concern. And to be quite frank, it is still a major health concern. One of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the world today still, um, even though you know we know more about it, but we'll get to that. So, these are the acid fast bacteria with this type of cell wall resist staining using the gram stain method so that's how they became known and now there are other staining methods that can be used to to show their presence so that makes them unique among the bacteria okay so looking at the role of peptidoglycan this is just because um, I couldn't help myself. The peptidoglycan, so what you see here is a sacculus of peptidoglycan. So when it's constructed, it is made as one big molecule, one big chain mail, you know, suit that surrounds the bacterial cell. And how they make that mesh is what determines the shape, the overall shape that the bacterial cell will take. And again, this is a feature that we can look at under the microscope and is in fact a way to distinguish among different types of bacteria. So for, you know, for the bacterial cells that have peptidoglycan, which is a large number, many of them, perhaps most of them, um, they have, you know, their peptidoglycan is made into this coating, this, this uh, you know, 
thing, a little baggie, if you will, um, that is referred to as the saculus. But it is made out of peptidoglycan, and that's actually just what this paper here goes through to describe in case you wanted to uh, read more about peptidoglycan and the saculus. So probably you don't. So we'll, uh, what I want to get back to is that, so the saculus determines the shape of the bacterial cell. And it turns out that bacterial cells, at least if they are, have peptidoglycan um, in their cell walls, can take on very characteristic shapes. So of course, we have to have a name for that. Um, so round shaped cells are referred to as cocci. Lo elongated cells are referred to as bacilli. Um, you have curved rods to varying degrees of curving. Um, those are referred to as vibrios. Actually, it's like a slight twist. Uh, Cocoa bacilli are short, fat rods. Then you have the spirilla, which are spiral shaped, and then the spirochetes, which are very long, skinny, and um, kind of tightly coiled. So these are the known shapes of bacteria. And I say that because there are other known shapes. But of the ones that you encounter in a laboratory setting, the ones that we work with in the laboratory, we're able to see their cells with a microscope. These are the most common shapes that you encounter. And quite honestly, the most common are the cocci and the bacilli. And then when the bacterial cell reproduces, um, the way they go through the process of division um, leads to the formation of different cellular arrangements that are also distinctive features that, ident that can help us identify bacterial species. So this is a lab, we'll be spending quite a bit of time in lab looking at different bacterial cell shapes and bacterial cell arrangements after we stain the bacteria um, and using it as a way to, to characterize them according to at least their shape. So I said most bacteria have peptidoglycan in their cell wall, some do not. And so those that do not have peptidoglycan, just starting off with this group called the, the molecutes, um, these are bacteria that have no cell wall. So it's not that they don't have an, uh, an outer envelope, they don't have something to contain um, you know, their cell membrane in their cells. It's made out of something that is not at all what you would expect in a bacterial cell wall. In fact, in the case of these bacteria, they are lipoproteins, mostly lipoproteins, meaning lipids and proteins combined. So it's kind of like this mesh thing that you see here, okay? So two notable species um, of these bacteria are mycoplasma and ureaplasma. So these are cell wall-less bacteria. They are very small. They're smaller than most other normal types of bacteria. And because they don't have a rigid cell wall, they don't have a peptidoglycan sacculus, they can take many different shapes. So you, what they normally look like under the microscope, and this is viewed with an electron microscope, by the way, are, you know, you've got a, a fat body with elongated ends. But these can actually, you know, kind of change form as they go, so they can pass through filters. Um, they can grow in many places where you wouldn't expect uh, these types of bacteria to grow because they can fit, you know, they, they, they're not confined to having to fit into a, a space. They can slither their way through um, practically anything. So these guys uh, were only recognized, by the way, as being in existence in the 60s when we started to culture human cells. And the human cell cultures would become contaminated periodically with bacteria that were of this type. And it turns out because they were invading the culture media because they were able to pass through filters. So they were uh, like viruses. In fact, they were thought to be viruses first, but then it was realized that they were actually cells. So this is a very um, unique uh, branch of the tree of bacteria. Um, and they are known to exist in both in states of disease and health. So it's kind of like, you know, they're there all the time. Sometimes they cause diseases. And then um, just a mention of the archaea. So remember, archaea are on the other branch of prokaryotes. So the tree of life comes up. The bacteria go one way and the archaea head off in this general direction. They are distinct from one another. They're distinct genetically, and that means they have distinct features. And one of those features is that archaea 
do not produce peptidoglycan. Uh, they produce other polymer molecules. Uh, they produce something called pseudomurine, which is a peptidoglycan-like um, molecule. And they also produce S layers, which are, again, those lipoprotein coatings. And in some cases, the lipoprotein coating is the only layer that the outer layer that the bacteria have outside of their cell membrane. And so then some of them have none of this. And I, I just want to, this is a very uh, unique thing about the archaea, looking at their cell membrane. So I'm, I said before that all cells have cell membranes and they're all made out of the same stuff, phospholipids. And that's true. That part is true. So notice that like in a bacterial cell membrane, this, by the way, is the universal diagram of a phospholipid, right? So here's the phosphate group that makes up the head. And here are the fatty acid chains, the two that make up the tails. And then remember that these are water, they avoid water, and these react with water. So the heads stick out while the tails stay underneath. And so they kind of float along in that fashion. Then we go over and look at the archaea. So archaea have phospholipids, but notice that the fatty acids are, have branching chemical groups. That's what these little side things are. And so those, those branches are unique from both bacteria and other eukaryotes. And then there are some that it's not a bilayer, so it's not a, a floaty layer of, you know, two things, two layers, it's a single layer, a monolayer. So that makes them quite distinct from bacteria. It also makes them distinct from the eukaryotes that you'll see in a little bit. Okay, so those are the different types of cell walls that bacteria might have. And then in addition to the cell wall, some bacteria also have additional coatings. So the coating itself is called the glycocalyx, which literally translates to sugar coat. Um, it is usually made out of some kind of polysaccharide. They call those mucoid polysaccharides. And if you want to know what that is, just blow your nose because that's what mucus is also. Um, and sometimes proteins and sometimes both. So this would be a layer or layers of this stuff outside of the cell wall. And so generally there are these two kinds of groups, the slime layer versus the capsule. So the slime layer, you know, picture what a slime layer looks like in your mind and you got it. So it is a layer of slime outside the cell, but it's very loosely organized. It can be very slimy, it gets drippy. Um, usually includes lipids as part of the whole thing. It's not attached to the bacterial cells. So in other words, they can produce this slime and leave it wherever they go. And that is as opposed to a capsule, which is a slimy coat that they carry around with them, which conveys superpowers to them. Not that making slime isn't a superpower, but these guys carry it around with them. And the slime coat actually protects the cell itself from observation by the immune system. So an immune system comes up, sees this slime cover thing, because the slime often is made out of molecules that our immune system recognizes as belonging to us. The immune system just says, oh, that, that's fine, I'm not gonna engulf it. It also makes them difficult to engulf. So it's a protective coat, um, kind of like a, a cloaking device on a Klingon ship and if you don't know what that is, you'll have to go look that up on Google um, because it's a Star Trek reference, okay? So it, it protects them, it makes them invisible, um, it helps them bind to, to cells and tissues, it helps them communicate to other tissues. And what I have here is a picture under the microscope at um, magnified 1000X stained using a type of staining called a capsule smear, where the darker staining pieces right here, those are the cells, right? So you can actually see the cells. And then you see like an outline around the cells and the outline is the capsule. So the capsule evades the staining process and it shows up as a clear zone around the outside of the cell. So encapsulated bacteria are typically associated with diseases because, the, because they can get past our immune system, they um, can be causes of disease. They can actually get infiltrate further and be able to cause diseases.
Okay, so the glycocalyx, and then there's also the S layer, um, which stands for surface. And generally, it's just an additional layer. It could be made out of a lot of different things. Um, but realize, remember that in the archaea, the S layer, it can, for some archaea anyway, that is the outer layer. That is the wall that makes up the wall. So it's not just a coat. It is actually the coat uh, for some types of archaea. So just briefly, just going back to the slime layer. So some bacteria can um, take that slime and use it to build cities. And those cities are called biofilms. So these are bacteria uh, that are find a location, settle down on that location, start producing slime, start talking to other nearby bacteria to produce more slime. And ultimately over several days, weeks, months, years, they build structures. Those, and I think of them as cities. So they build themselves big cities, they live in the cities, they um, work in the city, they have uh, shared duties when they live in the city. But you can see this is a, um, a view of Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the cause of Lyme disease. Um, so there are spirochetes. So you can see the individual spirochetes that are coming together to form a microcolony. And then at some point, they all in a coordinated fashion start to produce slime and then they start to build this biofilm, this city um, that has, in addition to the slime, they also put other very firm molecules, chemicals in there. They use DNA uh, in there, they use peptidoglycan in there. And you can see it takes on a very distinct form after a period of time. So this is just, um, this is from a scientific paper published on uh, the biofilm forming abilities of, that, of this bacteria. And notice three different microscope views. So this is dark field microscopy, this is phase contrast microscopy, and then this is uh, fluorescence microscopy showing, um, and this was done to show that this was definitely Borrelia burgdorferi because fluorescence, um, you have to stain it with a stain that has a, a probe on it that binds to that particular type of bacteria, right? So that's cool. You can see the roads, right, in there. You can see the buildings um, within uh, the biofilm. So, well, biofilms are also associated with health and disease, but the re in the real world, bacteria live in biofilms. They don't live as single colonies on plates. They don't do anything by themselves. Um, they're, they live in these communities, and many of them are biofilms. Okay, so keeping up the theme of sticking to the outside, um, looking at things that stick out from the bacterial cell. These are appendages, and they're filamentous, meaning they're filaments, and they stick out from the bacterial cell. They all have functions, of course, as well as structure. So looking at, so that you can see here, this uh, again taken with an electron microscope, these are two bacterial cells. This bacterial cell has, um, you can see several different types of appendages. The shorter ones, um, they're all called pili, by the way, and that's how it's pronounced. This word is pronounced pili, um, which are short tubes or long tubes made of a protein called pilin, which wraps up in a helical form. So in other words, it makes a tube. As the pilin molecules are formed, they wrap up to form this tube-like structure. So the short tubes are referred to as fimbriae. Um, the fimbriae are usually for the purpose of attachment. So at the end of the fimbriae, we know there are molecules called adhesins, which as you might guess, the role of the adhesin is to help bacteria adhere to surfaces. Um, and then this longer one is a called a conjugation pilus. So this pilus is actually for the bacteria to share uh, genetic information. In fact, it shares plasmids by sending DNA from this bacterial cell to that bacterial cell. So the bacteria, Usually the DNA is in the form of a plasmid, which I showed you earlier, which remember are in the cytoplasm. The genes for making these structures are often found on the plasmids. So what this bacteria has done is send over the blueprints to this bacteria, which will now also be able to make these structures. So it's a means of horizontal gene transfer, which is something that bacteria do on a daily basis. So, you know, they, they 
have no problems sharing genes with each other um, for the just the same way that we you know send text messages to each other. Okay, so then there's also stalks. Um, these are found on a group of bacteria which have the interesting name of the stalk and appendage bacteria as a, a rough group of them. And again, um, these guys are, they secrete adhesion factors as well. So in other words, this long, this almost uh, jellyfish looking or octopus looking thing uh, at the end of it would have adhesins that would allow it to attach to some surface. So they can float, but then they can attach like I said, similar to how a jellyfish would go through its day. I think probably the most notable of the appendages are the flagella. Um, bacterial flagella do the same thing that eukaryotic flagella do. They are for motility, meaning they make, they help the bacterial cell move. So in a bacterial cell, um, we happen to know a lot about the infrastructure of flagella. Um, so you can see this is the bacterial cell and then here are the flagella sticking out. When you do a close-up look at the uh, construct of the flagella, so the flagella itself is just a long tube made out of a different type of protein named flagellin. So it's a longer, stronger tube. Um, and again, some bacteria produce multiple flagella off of one cell, but they are hooked up to this motor uh, literally, this motor, which looks like this under an electron microscope. So you can actually see that it looks like it would be a motor that you would see in your car or on your, in your boat um, in, in terms of how it's constructed. So it's anchored to the membrane, goes through the cell wall and sticks out and the motor actually causes the flagella to spin like this. And as you might expect, that is able to, that, that allows the bacteria to be able to move. So um, the interesting thing is this motor next to it in the cell membrane are gas stations. So the electron transport system and, and the system that makes ATP, a flagella will have its own dedicated system that will be producing ATP so that it can run the motor so that it can run the flagella. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so, I, and I want to point out that spirochetes um, may, uh, that, spell, that cell shape, the long, skinny form, tightly wrapped, their flagella are wrapped around the outside of them. And then they are contained within a sheath, a membrane-like sheath. So as opposed to the flagella out there spinning, this contracts and it actually causes a corkscrew-like motion for uh, spirochete types of bacteria. So that is a unique feature of this type of bacteria, the spirochetes, is that their flagella are endoflagella, meaning they're within um, a sheath. So it would be no fun if, um, you know, everything was exactly the same. So bacteria, like I said, different species of bacteria will produce one flagella, they'll produce a couple, they'll produce bunches, they'll produce them all over the outside of their cells all for the purpose of motility. And as you might expect, the more flagella you have, uh, you know, the faster you're gonna be able to move and perhaps the more agile you will be. But you also have to coordinate all of the, you know, the motions of all those flagella in some way, right? So notice some bacteria have one flagella out of one end that's referred to as monotrichus. Amphitrichus means there are flagella coming out of both opposite ends. So here's the fun thing. This guy is gonna be able to go that way, right? He's gonna go that way, and then he's gonna to have to stop and go in another direction by turning the whole cell. This guy can go this way if this flagella is spinning, and then if he wants to go the other way, he shuts that one down and starts spinning the one on the other end. Yeah, they can do that, right? It's almost like they were thinking about it. And then, again, lophotrichus, you have all of these, uh, you know, flagella, you gotta, what happens is they don't all roll on their own. They actually bundle up, they form a bundle. And that's the same also um, with paratrichus bacteria. And so I'm not gonna do this, but if you would like to in the PowerPoint, um, you can actually just go to this link and you can watch bacteria swimming um, and having fun. So you can see that some of them can move quite quickly uh, and quite agilely using their flagella. 
All right, so then moving to the inside of the bacterial cell. Um, remember I said that, that, you know, bacteria have the basic floor plan inside. So they have um, DNA and RNA and the nucleoid. They have cytoplasm, they have ribosomes. Some can have additional, what we refer to as inclusion bodies. That's the old microbiology term. They are intracytoplasmic, meaning they are in the cytoplasm and their bodies in the cytoplasm. Okay, and there are many different forms of them, so they have names. So this is just a survey of some of the, you know, better known inclusion bodies of bacteria. Perhaps one of the best known are these called metachromatic granules, which is also referred to as gluten. And um, the reason why it's well known is because it was noted that the bacterium Perinibacterium diphtheriae, which is the cause of diphtheria, which again was in the age of the golden age of microbiology, a, con a considerable medical concern for kids to get diphtheria. Um, and actually it was a concern right up until the age of antibiotics, right in the 40s and 50s. And now of course there's vaccination um, to protect against C. diphtheria. But point being, um, they, this particular group of bacteria produce these metachromatic granules and they show up as dark staining bodies inside the cell. So you can see just, this is a simple stain. These are bacterial cells and this is a, it's a long rod shaped cell, but you can see the darker staining dots are the inclusion bodies, right? So those are, that's the volutin. So here's one view using methyl, methylene blue. Here's gram staining. So you can see them, they show up as purple. Um, and it, sometimes that's referred to as bipolar staining because you see that the ends appear darker than the middle. Um, so it takes a little bit of time to learn how to recognize that you are looking at metachromatic granules. Once you've got it, you've got it for life. And then this is a type of stain uh, named nicer, uh, nicer stain named after nicer, uh, where the metachromatic granules stain this darker color, but the cells stain green. So you can actually very clearly see the metachromatic granules in the, again within the cytoplasm of the cell. And the thing is they're bigger, they, they cause the cell to bulge out and that's why they become um, quite visible. So what are they? They store fat. Um, so sometimes they're called droplets. Poly beta hydroxybutyrate, PBH, is a type of fat. And so when you grow bacteria on media that have this stuff in there, they scarf it up like crazy and stuff it into these uh, metachromatic granules for storage purposes because it, it provides energy and building blocks. So, you know, you can make fat bacteria by feeding them polyhydroxybutyrate, which you'll see in a second. Okay, so this is a bacteria named Pseudomonas. These are the PHB granules that you can see right there. Um, so in other words, stored fat, and you can see when you grow them on the media that has it in there, they stuff it away as much as they possibly can, just in case. This one is, this area here is something called a BT or Bacillus thuringiensis crystal. So it is literally a crystalline molecule that is found within the cytoplasm of that particular type of bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, which also happens to produce, be an endospore forming bacteria. And this crystal is interesting because it turns out that um, when fly larvae, the larvae of certain insect species that reproduce in water, right? So the larvae show up in water. This would be any, you know, flies, black flies, things like that. Um, they feed on the, the bacteria, uh, these bacteria and others, but these have these crystals in them. And when the larvae, the insect larvae feed on these bacteria, it, the, the crystals block up their digestive tract and so the larvae die. And so it is a biological type of um, insect control uh, that you can go down to your local hardware store or Lowe's and buy actually. And they come in dunks, which is kind of an interesting thing. You have dunks of freeze dried bacteria that you throw into water. When the bacteria come back to life and the fly larvae hatch, um, that's when the magic happens. Okay, so then um, carboxysomes, anabena is a type of cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are photosynthetic bacteria widely found in practically every environment. Um, carboxysomes, if you recall, are where carbon fixation occurs, um, meaning this is where the bacteria 
are able to, well, actually any photosynthetic organism are able to, you know, convert precursors, convert CO2 into things like small sugar molecules um, in photosynthesis. So that those are bodies that are found in bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, just as um, this would occur at a, at a chloroplast. Um, and then sulfur globules, uh, this is a bacteria named thiomargarita. Um, thio referring to the fact that these are sulfur loving bacteria. And you can actually see the globules, the little bright refractive dots on the inside. Those are the storage vessels for sulfur. All right, and then my favorite um, inclusion body of all time are the magnetosomes. Again, obsessed with them. Very cool things. Uh, magnetosomes are the bodies filled with iron oxides. So the bacteria oxidize iron, they pack them into these uh, little crystals, right? Magnetite called magnetite, which is again, iron oxides. And they form a line uh, along the length of the cell, which you can see here clearly in the actual bacterial cell, uh, but you can see how they form across a line. And what that is, is a compass needle. So that's why, in case you're wondering, why there is a compass here. Because this allows the bacteria to align with the magnetic fields of the Earth, the north-south poles, and allows them to navigate north or south, or you know, in other words, toward areas where there's food or nutrients or away from them, um, depending on you know, what their end game is supposed to be. So it's, it's a compass, it's a navigation system for the bacteria, for magnetotactic types of bacteria. And then of course, Magneto is here because if this guy had any of these bacteria in him, Magneto would be able to manipulate him. So that's the only reason why we have that up there. That's not part of microbiology. It's just you know one of those fun facts that I like to add in here and there. Okay, so another type of inclusion body, but it's not exactly an inclusion body. So bacterial endospores are a form of reproduction. So endospores are what are formed when certain types of bacteria, um, and the two most notable types are Clostridium, which is a soil dwelling bacillus, uh, bacteria that's a bacillus, and also another a genus named Bacillus. One is aerobic, one is anaerobic. So these are the two major known endospore producers, um, but it gives them the superpower of being indestructible. And so that's why, in case you're wondering why we have this person coming, you know, walking through the flames, is because you literally can blow up um, the cell, you can blow up the surroundings, but you're not going to harm the endospore once it is fully formed. So the way this occurs is through a reproductive process. So the bacteria reproduce, they, they replicate their DNA, and then the two replicates separate from one another. And what the bacteria do is put one of the copies into a location within the cell that is predetermined by whatever the genes of that organism tell it where to put it. And then they proceed to build several walls around that genome, right? So this is a multi-stage process where they form membranes and they build, um, they use peptidoglycan glycan to form walls and then they form a spore coat around it. So by the time it's all over with, this is an endospore. So inside here is the genome of the, the complete genome of the bacteria. The rest of it is, becomes dried out and de desiccated. And then you can see the structure, the multi-layered structure around the outside of it, right? So this is a, the bacillus itself, the rod shaped cell, and here's the endospore. Here's a couple more pictures of it, right? So these are two bacterial cells. There's the endospore inside of it. So here's the deal. Once the endospore is formed, the, the bacterial cell throughout all of this is vegetative, meaning what that means is it's doing its thing. It's metabolizing, it's um, making, producing energy is making ATP and it's using the ATP to, you know, do its cellular work until the spore is complete. And when it is complete, the endospore is released. 
the rest of the cell disintegrates and goes away, and then this is freed from the cell. So the endospore is, can be you know, intracellular, intracytoplasmic, but ultimately it is released and it stays there in the environment, and I, it can stay there for millions and millions of years, which we know because we have been able to resurrect endospores from millions and millions of years ago. And by resurrect, I mean take the endospores that were made, you know, billions of uh, billion year, years ago and bring them back to life to become viable bacteria again. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of, that, that really is a superpower among bacteria, right? So, and like I said, this endospore is that person in that suit, indestructible to just about everything. So those are some of the um, very interesting features that I would say are unique to prokaryotic cells. Certainly not all of them, um, but it is many of them. Uh, and as we go forward talking about more and more types of bacteria, other stuff will come up. But, you know, when we talk about life being made out of cells, and I said we were going to focus on prokaryotic cells, of course, there's the other cell type, and that is eukaryotic cells. So, and I, I did also mention that I don't emphasize the eukaryotes as much, the eukaryotic cells as much, because you have spent much of your biological careers learning about all of these different fun structures that are found inside of eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotes have the basic floor plan with many, many upgrades, especially on the inside. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind this week is where, how did this cell come, where did it come from, right? How did it get all this complicated stuff? So we have this simple floor plan type of cell prokaryotes, and then we have this, you know, really upgraded top notch, all the stuff that's inside of it. And that's something um, to, that we're gonna talk more about as we talk about where eukaryotes come from and then how all that fits into the overall scheme of, of life, right? So just general characteristics. They are anywhere from 10 to 100, sometimes 1,000 times bigger than your average bacterial cell. So there are larger cells, um, probably because they have all this stuff inside of them that they have to make room for, which may have been why those cells expanded in size to begin with. These guys have a nucleus and therefore also include a nucleolus. So this is, again, that distinctive feature, really, the thing that separates the prokaryotes from the eukaryotes is that they have this nucleus, um, and that is in fact what the root of those two words are. Prokaryote means before nucleus. Eukaryote means true nucleus. Okay, so we have that. Here's our nucleus and our nucleolus. We have cells, eukaryotic cells tend to have a um, cytoskeleton, um, uh, protein molecules that stretch and wind uh, because again, it's a larger type of cell and to give structural support to keep everything kind of in place within there. So they have a cytoskeleton. They have an endomembrane system for transportation. When you're an itty bitty cell, you can move stuff around by diffusion and active transport. When you're bigger, you got to get stuff from place A to place B. And so that's what this endomembrane system is in place for, right? So what you're looking at here, hopefully you remember, is the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, which is where the ribosomes are found in a eukaryotic cell. And then also the Golgi apparatus, um, which I separated out because it's a song by Fish. Um, and I'm not going to play it for you, but if you'd like to go hear the song by Fish, if you have not already, please feel free to click on the link and it will take you right there and you can listen to the song Golgi apparatus by Fish. So um, what else do they have? They have mitochondria and chloroplasts, and I'm going to get back to that one. But they also have, you know, the the same, you know, well, not the same, but their own sets of intracytoplasmic bodies, like lysosomes, like vacuoles, like um, endo endosomes. They have all kinds of different names um, for bodies, depending on what their overall function is. So hopefully, you know, just looking A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all those things, you would be able to at this point. Um, look at those and recognize those, be able to name each of those, um, and then also give a brief overview of what their function is. And if you can't, maybe that's something that you should go back and review, which 
lucky you, it's very well explained in your textbook. All right, so I wanna just talk about the mitochondria and the chloroplasts for a second. So one of the distinctive features of eukaryotes is they have these organelles that are called mitochondria and chloroplasts. They're called the energy organelles because mitochondria are responsible for producing ATP that keeps our cells going, right? The animal um, and plant cells, all of us eukaryotes. And then um, certain types of eukaryotes, plants and algae, have chloroplasts, which allows them to trap sunlight energy and use that energy to help them um, fix carbon dioxide into organic molecules. So mitochondria and chloroplasts, we've noted them inside of cells for a very long period of time. But the point being, there are some very interesting characteristics about them um, that starting about 1960 into the 1970s, it became clear that the mitochondria were not just these organelles found inside of our cells, they were actually derivatives of bacteria. So way, way back in the day, um, not way, way back, but a scientist named Lynn Margulis, who was uh, you know, an environmental biologist, said, you know what? We're not all these separate and distinct beings, back to the ecosystem approach. Um, you know, for example, mitochondria are actually bacteria inside of our cells. And of course, for the first 10 years that she said that, she was considered wacky. And then it was like, whoa, she's actually right. And that's where the um, endosymbiosis theory has come from. So that what that states, and here's just the, the big picture overview of the endosymbiosis theory, uh, which is that at the beginning of evolutionary time, we had cells, right? So that would be our um, you know, the cells came first and they were prokaryotic in design, right? They had the basic floor plan, just what you needed to have a cell. And then about 1.5 billion years ago, all of a sudden, when you look at the fossil record, all of a sudden, mitochondria and chloroplasts start to appear. Probably mitochondria first, uh, who knows? But the point being, it's like, all right, so then they started to look more closely at the mitochondria and they realized that there are many characteristics that mitochondria have that, that make no sense. Like for example, mitochondria have their own genomes. They have their own sets of genes. And mitochondria have their own ribosomes. They have their own enzymes. They make their own stuff. So it's sort of like, well, what is this like a cell within our cell, right? So cells are doing all these things. Anyway, you know, they're doing those the exact same things, but these are little bodies inside that are doing all those things separately they reproduce on their own. So mitochondria will make more mitochondria inside one host cell. So all of that makes a microbiologist, especially a bacteriologist say, hmm, that sounds like it could be a bacteria. And so looking at you know, this idea that way, way back when there were just a bunch of cells around, they entered into relationships. So the relationships could have been symbiotic, meaning they just decided, hey, you know, this is gonna work out, let's just live together. Or it could have been parasitic, meaning one of them ate the other one. But then ultimately the other one was like, yeah, hey, don't eat me because I, I, got, I can give you, a, I can you know, pay back what we're doing here. And so they ended up in a relationship where one lives inside the other, they both benefit. So the relationship between our cells, right? So a eukaryotic cell and its mitochondria is definitely a mutualistic relationship. So we provide the mitochondria with, um, you know, raw materials and the mitochondria turn it into, you know, vast quantities of ATP, which allows cell to do their cellular work. Right? So that happened with mitochondria and for those types of plants that are photosynthetic, it also happened with chloroplasts. And here's, you know, here's the last little bit of information that when you, you can remove the mitochondrial genome and sequence it, and when you put it on the family tree, the phylogenetic tree of life, it goes to the bacteria branch. So in other words, the genome of mitochondria matches that of some bacteria. And in fact, the type of bacteria it matches most closely to are called alpha proteobacteria which today, the alpha proteobacteria, um, are all known to be intracellular parasites. Isn't that interesting? So in other words, they invade cells and they 
take over those cells as their way of life, kind of like what the mitochondria did, although it turned out to be a much more um, even and mutual relationship between those two things. So all of that is uh, very interesting stuff. So now, you know, the, this, the dialogue says, here's, these are remnants of bacteria. They're not bacteria anymore because they can't live on their own. They have to be inside of those cells. But the point being, they meet the definition of life. They're just doing it inside of other cells. So here's one of those gray areas. Is a mitochondria alive? And some would say no, because you can't take mitochondria out of the cell and expect it to survive. It has to be inside the cell, but it meets all the other characteristics of life. So one of those gray areas when it comes to that good old definition of life. One of many, I might add. Okay, so then when you put all that together, um, the mitochondria, like I said, the oldest records the going back show that mitochondria um, were present at the beginning of the eukaryotes. So in other words, it was probably the thing that led to the rise of eukaryotes. And that's what the article, um, which you can read by going um, online, or it is also in our course Blackboard, to read about um, you know, how, how the role of the mitochondria in leading to the evolution of of eukaryotes, of all eukaryotes. And then if you recall, I had mentioned that the tree of life, the phylogenetic tree of life, um, they call it a tree, but it was really more of a shrubbery. And this is what I mean by that. So when you look at this tree, so this, that was, this is the same tree, but when you look at how organisms have shared past and shared genes and things along the line, you can see that there's a lot of branches going back and forth and back and forth. So this is more of a shrubbery. So we talk about the tree of life, but realize that when we look at it genetically, it's a shrubbery, right? So you can see here's our bacteria branch and our archaea branch. And most, you know, most trees show the archaea branch leading up to um, the eukaryotes. But realize that eukaryotes have mitochondria, which come directly from bacteria. So it's both branches coming together that lead, led to the first eukaryotes, which were single cell, probably protists, right? So protozoa were probably among the first. Um, and then and to the multicellular life forms and keep them going up the tree until we get to the plants and the animals. So that's where we are when we consider all of the relatedness of all of the different types of living things, remembering that cell-wise, there's still only two basic cell plans. There are the prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea, which have the prokaryotic cell plan. And then there are the eukaryotes, which have the eukaryotic cell plan. Okay, so we'll carry this on further to talk about um, the diversity uh, among these different groups. Um, and what I mean by that is we're going to just kind of point out that, for example, the word bacteria is pretty broad and there's several subgroups of bacteria. There's several subgroups of archaea and the, as you might expect, many on the eukarya side as well. So enjoy the rest of your day and uh, see you next time.